days. I don't believe I sent it to evenings yet, so I'm going to start a couple questions tonight, tomorrow, and Wednesday morning. Um, but let's go over. So you have on the test hepatic, renal, respiratory, stress and pee, um, yeah. post traumatic stress and coping. Stress and coping. Stress and coping. Okay, perfect. All right. So and hep communications. And communication. Yes. Okay. So um, Dr. Smith has determined that the client with hepatitis has contracted the infection. Uh, from contaminated food, the nurse understands that the client is most likely experienced and what type of hepatitis. So A. A is correct. So basically, yes for the test, this is just memorization. What type of um, hepatitis? So, you know, the, truthfully, um, the most common in this area is A, B, and C. So most of the test banks that are out there don't even hit um, anything but A, B, and C. So I know uh, D, you need to have had B, and E, it's kind of connected with the same thing like A, oral fecal. So memorize it, but these are probably where the questions are going to come from. So, um, um, prevention of hepatitis A. Good hand hygiene. Good hand hygiene. Hand washing, hand, hand hygiene. Um, sanitation. Sanitation, so sewer sanitation, safe water supply, and immunizations. So those are the big ones. What type of precautions for people with hepatitis? Standard. Standard, Standard precautions, okay. A client is suspected of having hepatitis. Which diagnostic, diagnostic test result will assist in confirming the diagnosis? So basically, when I see that, I want to say a test that jumps out liver. Which one here? Billy Rubin is correct. So, you know, when I look at this, when I see infection, yes, uh, we may have. Um, Changes in sed rate actually goes up with an infection, not down. But again, it's nothing really specific to um, liver where the bilirubin is. Yeah? So, say it was another question like that, but you said they had like the ALT and the ASD, and say bilirubin was in there as well. Which one would you go for? You would have to have a select all that apply. Okay. Yes. So now it's my liver, uh, my liver enzyme test. Yeah, my liver function test and my bilirubin. There's no way you can separate that out. Um, all right, hepatitis B, preventative measures. The vaccine, yep. Standard for cost. Because it's, um, you get it through blood, people get blood transfusions. It doesn't have like better screening. So better screening for blood uh, and standard precautions and the immunization. So someone, as a healthcare provider, without the vaccine, you've been exposed to hepatitis B, what are we going to do? Immunoglobulin. Immunoglobulin, yep. So immunoglobulin prophylactic. All right. So again, these are um, the different types. So... IV drug abusers at risk for Pepsi. Yep, that's B and C. And all right, so preventative measures then for Hep C. So um, a lot of the same things that we talked about is standard precaution, uh, but again, contaminated needles, make sure. You know, the needles aren't sticking up in a uh, puncture uh, container and that they're safely put in there. All right. A patient with advanced cirrhosis has been diagnosed with hepatic encephalopathy. Wait, what oh, wait. <laughs> oh, did I uh, jump past this one? Okay, a patient with hepatitis B is being discharged in two days. In the discharge teaching plan, the nurse should include instructions to 
avoid alcohol for the first three weeks, use a condom during sexual intercourse, have family members get an injection of immunoglobulin, or follow low protein, moderate carbohydrate, moderate fat diet. B is correct. So yes, we need to decrease exposure to body and blood fluid. So that is protective um, sex. So using the condoms. We would want to avoid alcohol altogether, not just for three weeks. Okay. So now jumping over to cirrhosis. Client with advanced cirrhosis has been diagnosed with hepatic encephalopathy. The nurse expects to assess for. So um, end stage liver disease, cirrhosis, there are many different symptoms that occur. Hepatic encephalopathy is just one. What is hepatic encephalopathy? It's when the brain so it's we're certainly going to ammonia. see mental status change. Why? Because of the increase of the ammonia. So increased neurotoxin in the blood, that happens to be uh, uh, ammonia. So, and what we'll see, early signs, mental status change, and as, hand as tremors, yes, direxis. So it's as, like the flapping as, of the hands. How as a nurse can I see if these are occurring? I can ask them to write. If the handwriting is really off, it may be a sign if they have a hand tremors. And sometimes I can see it in the gate. Ask them, I can assess uh, them walking. All right, so what can I do about it? Lactulose, very good. So lactulose, um, binds to the ammonium, um, uh, uh, the ammonia, and then it pulls it out in a stool. So what is, um, what, do, what are we looking for when we give lactose? Two to three, three, three stools, soft stools. Two to three soft stools a day. So if we have diarrhea, we may have to cut back on the lactose, but our goal is two to three uh, loose stools, uh, soft loose stools. Um, so what is uh, the co major cause of cirrhosis? Oh. Alcohol. alcohol. Yeah, so alcohol. Um, other complications that we may see from cirrhosis is portal hypertension. What is portal hypertension? <laughs> So increased pressure in the portal vein, usually due to obstruction of blood flow in the portal vein. Another thing that we may see is ascites. What's ascites? Fluid in the stomach. Fluid in the abdomen, absolutely. So I'm gonna uh, just randomly pick uh, people. Tell me non-invasive how I can get rid of fluid in the abdomen, non-invasive. Diuretic. Diuretic. Talk to me how I would get rid of it through an invasive procedure. Paracentesis. Paracentesis. Very good. So, um, and so anytime I'm going in an invasive procedure, I have a risk of puncturing something and causing a hemorrhage or Again, within a couple days, I may risk having an infection, peritonitis. Again, uh, board-like abdomen, um, or if I'm draining it, I can see cloudy fluid. All right, esophageal varices, what is it? So dilated veins in the esophagus. Again, usually caused from increased pressure in the veins. So um, how do I prevent a rupture? Beta block is, I'm going to decrease the pressure to the beta block is, and then you're not off. I want to prevent pressure. Stool softeners so they don't strain to go to the bathroom. 
I want, don't want cough and vigorously, so I may need to give cough medicine. Um, I don't want them lifting weights because it could put extra pressure and cause bleeding. Uh, so no um, vigorous uh, sports activity. Now, the varicic ruptures causing bleeding. How do I, you, how do you as a nurse respond? Octreotide, some meta choice, octreotide. Then we need to do fluid replacement, uh, vasopressors, uh, volume expander, that type of stuff. But what else? How about like the Blakemore? Blakemore too. too. So I'm gonna, that's going to put like tension on that area to put pressure to stop the bleeding. Big concern about a Blakemore tube is it can rise up and actually include breathing, so someone must stay in the room. Um, if they have trouble breathing, what is your priority? Cut the cord. I'm going to cut it with scissors, take it out, and respond to the emergency. Probably give them oxygen if my O2 staff's dropping. Okay, jaundice, what is it? An uh, increase of. So it's a yes, a yellowish um, tinge to the skin from uh, that you cannot excrete the bilirubin. So the problem with liver um, failure is they have a buildup of bile salts and they excrete it in sweat and then they're itching, so paritis. So keeping the nails short, um, washing with uh, tepid water just to wash away the bile salts and then we may have to give them something to uh, decrease the itch. Okay, so, um, someone over here said it earlier, one of you two said it. Lab work, liver enzyme test, what are they? ALT, AST, and then we also have the LDH and then the bilirubin. So those are your typical um, and then certainly ammonia level. Um, so with, going back to hepatic encephalopathy, one of the things that I'm going to be very concerned of a nurse if somebody with cirrhosis comes in and tells me they have constipation. That's very concerning because they should be taking lactulose, they should not have constipation. Constipation is going to lead to increased hepatic encephalopathy because it's the stools that pull off the ammonia. Um, the, it's actually the lactulose that pulls it off uh, in the stool. Nurse Jury, his care for client with cirrhosis of the liver. To minimize the effect of the disorder, the nurse teaches the client about foods that are high in thiamine. The nurse determines that a client has the best understanding of the dietary measures to follow if the client states an intention to increase the intake of. So one of these is high in thiamine. What is thiamine? B. B1. So people with um, cirrhosis usually have a B1 deficiency. So um, anyone want to? So most people go for chicken or broccoli. Thiamine is found in sesame seeds, sunflower seeds, pork chops, pine nuts, pistachio, macadamia nuts, fish, and pecans. So mostly in our pork, fish, and nuts. So looking here, um, you know, poultry is not bad because it does have niacin and they're deficient in a lot of things with the alcohol. So, and then the broccoli is not bad because they're probably also deficient in folic acid and other vitamin K, and, but the one that has uh, thymine is your pork. All right, a client diagnosed with chronic cirrhosis 
who has a site in pitting peripheral edema also has hepatic encephalopathy. Which of the following nursing interventions are appropriate to prevent skin breakdown? Select all that apply. So when you read the test, everyone hates select all that apply. But I want you to really know what it says. Prevent skin breakdown. So I'm going to say true or false. Range of motion every four hours prevents skin breakdown. True or false? False. False. It, it keeps me limber, prevents contractions, but it does not prevent skin breakdown. That's a false. Turn and reposition every two hours prevents yeah. skin breakdown. Yeah. True. <clears throat> Abdominal and foot massage every two hours prevents skin breakdown. False. 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 May feel good, although even I'm not going to do an abdominal <laughs> massage on someone who has cirrhosis. Um, alternating ear pressure mattress prevents sure. skin breakdown. Sure. Absolutely. Sitting in a chair for 30 minutes each shift prevents skin breakdown. No. 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 So, you know, it. I know it sounds like a uh, change in positions, but somebody who has a lot of fluid in their abdomen, who has edema in the legs, only going to put them at increased risk laying down. They really should have their legs up. Because again, there's just so much pressure with all that fluid sitting there. So we don't want them sitting 30 minutes. I can get them up for a little bit, but 30 minutes is even going to be way too much for them sitting with all that. And uh, again, peripheral edema, I want the feet up. So really, the only two are B and D. So really make sure you go back to the question. What is the question asking? Spirolactone is prescribed for a client with chronic cirrhosis and ascites. The nurse would want the client for which of the following med-related side effects? Hyperkalemia. Tell me some of the signs and symptoms we are going to see for hyperkalemia. So peak T wave. Someone else said, did I hear? Muscle weakness. So we're going to see diarrhea, dizziness, headaches. Um, we're going to see um, muscle weakness, change in cardiac symptoms, uh, peak T waves. So with cirrhosis, we have uh, end stage liver. We have neurological, hepatic encephalopathy. We have a lot of gastrointestinal issues going on, reproductive, integumentary, jaundice. Uh, hematological bleeding. One of the things I didn't mention on the first slide, so let me talk about bleeding and metabolic, uh, cardiovascular. So why is bleeding an issue? Well, clotting factors. They're missing clotting factors, so they're at increased risk of bleeding. That's why when we do any type of um, Biopsy of the liver, we're laying them on the side in the biopsy to put pressure to prevent bleeding. But if somebody with end stage liver disease falls, you bring them to the bathroom, they trip, they land, and they hit the sink on their abdomen, my priority is call the physician. I am, you know, someone who's missing a lot of clotting factors, falls against the sink could be internal bleeding going on now. So now we have to evaluate. Even though they may, may not have gone all the way to the floor, they, it is an issue. So again, everything for bleeding precautions, uh, things that we're going to do with the end stage. Um, so I am going to question if the physician puts them on warfarin or heparin, because they already are not going to clot. So if all of a sudden I see someone uh, cirrhosis on an anticoagulant, I'm questioning that order. Um, so how do I measure fluid uh, gain or loss? I'm going to do the uh, daily weights, abdominal girth, intake output. Um, so those are all different things I can measure. Do you get vitamin K? No. 
Um, so, so you're saying vitamin K, because I don't believe, that, I mean, it is one of the clotting factors, but they got a couple clotting factors that are an issue. Um, if they were bleeding, I mean, they may try and give something like that, but they, they are at risk for bleeding. When the um, esophageal varices go, it sounds great that we sit here and say a triotide and a Blakemore tube, but basically it's almost like a death sentence. Um, you know, if it ruptures, a lot of time there is nothing we can do no matter what we've tried. Basically in hospice, if someone's varices break, we just know we just put navy blue or black sheets on the bed and we don't tell the family. So when it goes, it looks like it's just wet on the bed and I, we just manage it. We have black towels, navy blue towels, black sheets, navy blue sheets, because they're gonna bleed out. Um, and it's, this, it's just, it's hard to control a rupture of a, an esophagus that just bleeds out. Um, okay, so let's see what else I have here. When planning care for a patient with cirrhosis, the nurse will give highest priority to which of the following nursing diagnosis? Impaired nutrition, less than body requirement, impaired skin integrity related to edema, ascites, and paritis, Excessive fluid volume related to portal hypertension and hyperaldosteronism. And ineffective breathing pattern related to pressure on the diaphragm and reduced lung volume, which has the highest D. priority. D. A, B, C, A, this is an uh, airway breathing issue, always going to have a priority over the others. So that is correct. The healthcare provider orders lactulose for patients with hepatic encephalopathy. The nurse will monitor for effectiveness of this medication for this patient by assessing what? What level are we assessing? Mm -hmm. Ammonia level. Absolutely. So again, already talked about lactulose. What's the over-the-counter med that's metabolized in the liver that typically could lead to liver failure? Acetaminophen. Like Acetaminophen. Yep, that's the um, too much. That's why we always say the saline of Tylenol because it could lead to liver failure. Um, so care for a patient with liver disease. The nurse recognized the need to prevent bleeding resulting from altered clotting factor and rupture of varices. Which nursing intervention would be appropriate to achieve this outcome? Select all the five. So again, use smallest gauge needle possible and give an injection of drawing blood to prevent bleeding. True. True. Teach patient to avoid straining at stools vigorously below the nose and coughing to prevent bleeding. True. Advise the patient to use soft bristle toothbrush and avoid ingestion of irritating food to prevent True. bleeding. True. True. Apply gentle pressure for the shortest period of time period after performing a Vita puncture to prevent bleeding. False. False. We want the longest time. Instruct patients to avoid aspirins and NSAIDs uh, to prevent hemorrhage when the varices are present to prevent uh, bleeding. True. So it's everything but D. What is the priority concern of a nurse administering narcotics and sedatives to a client with cirrhosis? So without even me looking, what would be my big concern? Liver can't metabolize it. So um, if I'm giving them narcotics and sedatives, I need to switch to meds that the um, kidney metabolizes versus um, what the liver metabolizes. So when renal failure, I can give them Tylenol because it doesn't affect the kidneys, but um, again, we have to look at the medications where they're metabolized. 
A 65-year-old female with a history of hepatic encephalopathy, encephalopathy is hospitalized for pneumonia and dehydration. When she complains to the nurse about the small portions of meat ordered by the dietitian, the best response would be, ask your doc about it, the amount of meat in your tray is dictated by certain blood test results, or your protein is being limited, but you can have more food from another group. Three is correct. So again, we are, they're on a low protein diet. So diet is huge. So low protein, what else? Low sodium. Low sodium. So um, fluid restricted. What one did you say? High carbs. And high carbs, yes. So, uh, Going back to um, the question with um, administering narcotics and sedatives, yeah. why wouldn't it be D? Narcotics and sedatives are contradicted in clients with cirrhosis. Because we, like, I feel like we were told that we eliminate um, giving them sedatives, especially in end stage for encephalopathy. So, one thing I'm going to tell you, there's very few things out there that, um, it, like, is never. Okay. I am a hospice nurse. We treat pain for cirrhosis patients with hepatic encephalopathy with narcotics that are metabolized by the kidney, not liver, because they're in pain. And the whole goal is comfort. So, and cirrhosis is an end stage disorder. So, I mean, if we could avoid it, I mean, it would be more avoid, but it's not contraindicated. So, it really, it's the liver cannot metabolize drugs effectively. All right. Did I do this one? Yep, I did this one. Um, okay, the nurse is concerned that time with a ruptured aorta will develop signs of liver failure. What is the nurse's concern? So you told me the number one reason for liver failure is alcohol, he hepatitis can be another, or ruptured aorta can be another cause. And why would that be? If my aorta ruptured, why would I be concerned of liver failure? The blood flow. The client's order is the main blood flow to the liver. You cut off the oxygen and blood flow to the liver, you're going to end up with liver failure. A 52-year-old man was referred to the clinic due to increased abdominal birth. He is diagnosed with ascites by presence of fluid, thrill, and shifting dullness on percussions. After administering diuretic therapy, which nurse in action would be most effective in ensuring safe care? So again, we know he has ascites. We've given him diuretic. Um, what are we going to do? I know. So for safe care, we're going to monitor uh, intake and output. So um, we, he would have hypovolemia. Yeah. How often are we going to measure weights? Daily. So let's go to this one. Measure serum potassium for hyperkalemia. Why hyper? So most of the time, it's going to be hypo if it's pulling it off. But it doesn't really even tell me what type. But most times, it's more hypokalemia that we're running into problems. That's why that one is um, not correct. Which assessment finding indicates that lactulose is effective in decreasing the ammonia level in a client with hepatic encephalopathy? I already said this, two to three stools. Nurse Farrer is providing care for Christoph, who has jaundice. What statement indicates the nurse understands the rationale for instituting skin care measures for this client? So, why are we doing skin care? So, D. 
It's uh, because the bile salts coming through, causing colitis, itching. Um, that's why we're doing skin care. C. 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 So it's the bile acid excretion. Mr. Haskin is an end-stage liver failure. Which intervention should the nurse implement when addressing hepatic encephalopathy? Select all that apply. Assess the client's neurological status every two hours to assess hepatic encephalopathy. True. Monitor the client's H and H level to address hepatic encephalopathy. False. You know, I may want to do that to figure out bleeding risk, and, uh, but I'm not doing it for hepatic encephalopathy. Evaluating the client's serum ammonia level to assess to address hepatic encephalopathy. True. True. Monitor the client's handwriting daily to True. assess. True. 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 Prepare to insert an esophageal tamponade tube to assess to address hepatic encephalopathy. False. And make sure the client's fingernails are short to address hepatic encephalopathy. False. That's for pruritus. This is for an actual bleed, but again, the others we said. Um, so uh, the reason you're hearing me go back is because a lot of times I'm recognizing people, when I did this this morning, they want to say true for everything. So I'm trying to stress back to what the question is. So on the test, you can stress back and go back to what are they really asking. What was the answer, I guess, Karen? Please. So A, C, and D. Thank you. All right, so what is the treatment for end-stage liver failure? Transplant. Transplant is the treatment. Um, you know, we can manage symptoms, but really, uh, transplant is the only thing that we're going to be able to do. But again, they, since alcohol is the biggest cause for cirrhosis, alcohol is really the biggest reason that keeps people off transplant list because they cannot be drinking. So is it safe to say they can't drink alcohol on the exam? Or does it they should should it? So say that again, is it safe to say? If one of the answers is like they can't drink it, is it safe to say they can't or should we say they shouldn't? No, they cannot. For a transplant, they are actually, for, to be on the transplant list, no in alcohol, they carry a beeper. And when the beeper goes off, they randomly will uh, do uh, alcohol screening. You have 20 to 30 minutes from the time that beeper comes off to get in for an alcohol screen. Wow. If they miss it, they're off the transplant list. Wow. So they cannot be busy. This is your life. What about if you're so far away from the, like, you need to get to a hospital, okay. and so it does not necessarily mean that you need to go to the hospital that's beeping you. So, if, um, you know, uh, Brigham and Women's is your hospital, and you're in Maine. You need to get to a lab and and have a urine drug uh, alcohol screen. So again, it's very strict. And because they know the urgency, would they just like do it? walk in and say, like, I'm beeping, I need to get this done now. They'll just Correct. The most, unfortunately, just because I've, I've worked with a lot of liver failure, most will pretend they didn't get it because they're drinking. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because they're drinking. <laughs> um, you know, so a lot of them, um, you know, so unfortunately, yeah. what happens in liver failure is you'll get to a point where one hospital will say, we're done. You're off the list. We have nothing else we can do. So they move to the next hospital. Then they end up maybe on their list and for transplant, but they do the same thing. But unfortunately, if they can't stop drinking, it is picked up pretty quickly if they're on the transplant list. All right.
is the transplant list national like people know like every hospital they kind of talk to each other so the question is is the transplant list national so it is they do connect but they're not, not everyone knows the name of the people okay. they just know that they need someone that matches certain blood type okay do you have to be sober for like a certain amount of time or is it just you have to you, go from that point on you are supposed to be sober for a certain period of time and no alcohol. It's a huge problem for liver uh, cirrhosis that are caused by alcohol. How much of these people like drinking like bottles of hot alcohol a day? Like, I mean, I'm just curious. Like, yeah, I mean, that's hard for me to say, but yes, that's exactly. Um, you know, I had a stepbrother that dropped, died from cirrhosis and he could barely breathe they allowed him to go home for one day just because um, he wanted to, I don't know, it was a, a roommate of his birthday, so they allowed it, and he went out and got drunk. Oh. One day, uh, he could barely breathe, he was rushed back in the hospital because of all the fluid, and he just, you know, so it happens, they just can't stay away. And now when you're at the stage, when you're a little confused for encephalopathy, you may have discomfort because of the ascites, trouble breathing because of the ascites. Turning to alcohol is almost the answer for a lot of them. Even though they know they're gonna die, they don't wanna admit they're gonna die, but they do end up turning to that. So, um, but I've seen it so many times. All right. A client uh, with hepatic uh, cirrhosis who's had an altered clotted mechanism, which intervention would be most important? Mm -hmm. B, we need to apply pressure to injection sites. Um, otherwise, uh, allow complete independence for mobility. Well, depends. I mean, in someone who has trouble walking for encephalopathy, I don't necessarily want complete independence. I may have to have contact guide so they don't fall. Um, antibiotics is not going to do anything for clotting and increased nutritional intake. Again, not necessarily for clotting. Okay, so big things, you're going to memorize the hepatitis um, and then what you're going to do for them. That's it for hepatitis. There's not a lot more except for how it's transmitted, how you're going to prevent it. Cirrhosis, there's a lot, mm -hmm. from bleeding to uh, esophageal varices, portal hypertension, to jaundice, to ascites, uh, you name it, bleeding, there's so much. So yes, just recognizing all the things that can go wrong. But basically, you get a good picture of what they look like, mm -hmm. then what are you gonna do with it? You can answer most of the questions. All right. So, alcohol, uh, chemical substance abuse. A client who abuses alcohol tells the nurse, I'm sure I can become a social drinker. What is the most appropriate response by the nurse? So again, these are things you hate. What is the response? But uh, when do you think you can become a social drinker? What makes you think you'll learn to drink normally? Does your alcohol use cause major problems in your life? I would say four. And how many alcoholic beverages can a social drinker consume? Because their number is always going to be different. So basically, for alcohol to be an issue, we don't really care the number of what they drink, because that's going to be different for everyone. Basically, we want to know, does it cause problems in their life? So what are signs of substance abuse? Um, what is it? You can't really function day to day. So you have trouble functioning, frequent calling to work, unusual behavior, poor performance at work, Denial. maybe fired from one job after another, isolation from others, lying about how much they're taking, um, hiding um, alcohol, drinking alone, slurred speech, all of those certainly can be a problem. Um, so someone who abuses alcohol typically rationalizes why they drink. Oh, you know, if I didn't have such a stressful day at work, I wouldn't have to come home and have a drink. 
Um, you know, if the kids would just listen to me, I wouldn't have to have a drink. Um, so they tend to rationalize um, all the um, drinking that they do. Um, so long-term heavy drinkers, it is not safe for them to quit cold turkey. So for nursing, what our big concerns are when somebody comes in the hospital, we find out they're heavy drinkers, is alcohol withdrawal. So our whole goal is for them to go through withdrawal with minimum complications. What are some of the complications that they may have as a result of alcohol withdrawal? Seizures. 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 Hallucination. Hallucination. Delirium. Delirium. So they have like tremors. Tremors. Um, seizures. Um, so all of these can be uh, part of it. So, um, so what would I do for tremors and prevent seizures? Benzodiazepine, so Librium is really the uh, drug of choice that we use. How would I handle um, preventing hallucinations? Um, isn't it like a quiet environment? So we want to decrease stimulation. Low lights, TV off, radio off. If there's an intercom in the room, we really want it off. We want to decrease um, stimulation. <clears throat> we want to prevent shadows. So uh, if they have a bathroom in their room, we really try and close the bathroom door so no shadows are thrown, because otherwise it'll, it'll lead to them having hallucinations. Um, so AA is something that really does help them after. A nurse caring for a client who experienced alcohol withdrawal. The nurse would be most concerned if the client exhibits which of the following? Which one is our most concerned? One. All the others, nervousness, diaphoresis, nausea, early signs, was now starting to get into late signs. So again, we have, um, I'm concerned that they're hallucination, and then again, could be seizures that they're going to have. When assessing the client with prolonged chronic alcohol intake, the nurse would expect to find which of the following? Enlarged liver, so we just left uh, um, cirrhosis. A client's history of daily bourbon drinking for the past six months. He is brought to the emergency department by family who reports that his last drink was one hour ago. It is now 12 midnight. When should the nurse expect to exhibit withdrawal symptoms? Like so how many hours? 72 hours. 72 hours. 72 hours. 72 hours. Three days. So the thing is, is um, um, anywhere from four hours, you may start to experience headache. But go by the 12. The 12, you're starting to experience a lot more symptoms. So, um, and then it could go longer. But you can experience. Uh, the answer here is one. Anywhere from 3 a.m. to 11 a.m., you can start to exhibit withdrawal symptoms. Again, headache, you may um, just have nervousness, but uh, at the beginning of the third day, you know, you'll already have symptoms then shortly after a 24 hour period. So, no, it's actually before that we're going to start to see them. But our more Severe symptoms we're going to see 12 hours or later. And this is if they're not, because usually they're like sleeping. Yeah. Like so you're right. So That's um, the next day. you're right. So a lot of times you may not, because they may just be sleeping. Sometimes they just pass out. Uh, but sometimes what we'll do is they come in one hour ago. Their last drink was at midnight. They couldn't even have a mood change, and they could be angry that they're in, and that could be even some of the withdrawal because they typically it's midnight, but they drink till 3 a.m. and they need that drink. So, 
So yeah, so use about the 12 hours as your um, so I the morning class brought this up. So when it peaks, and they said it was in their notes. Yeah, I have to write it. Oh, okay. But in what notes, is in your notes? In the notes, because I think they said the word severe. You were saying early. Symptoms. Oh yeah, I'm saying mild early. Yeah, because it says severe symptoms of 12 to 72 hours yeah. after the last drink and continue five to seven days. Yeah. So some of the more severe, and that's when you should almost be looking at the peaks, 12, and it go later. But you can uh, see them as early as just a couple hours. Mood change, headaches. Um, I was just about to, oh, what um, diagnosis in the emergency room mimics alcohol where they come in, slurred speech, fruit, uh, stroke, stroke. Al alcohol breath, Oh, oh diabetes. diabetes. Yeah, diabetes. Yeah, hypoglycemia. Okay. A client is admitted for alcohol detoxification. During detoxification, which symptom should the nurse expect to assess? So, which one would we expect? Gross tremors, delirium, hyperactivity, hypertension, disorientation, peripheral neuropathy, hypotension. Alveolar crisis, amnesia, ataxia, and hypertension, hallucination, fine tremors, confabulation, orthostatic <laughs> hypertension. So here's the thing. One of the so biggest good. symptoms that I do not want you to forget is a shift upward in vital signs. So someone comes in, the blood pressure um, at 11 p.m. is 110 over 70, pulse 72, respirations 18, um, and half an hour I go in and now the blood pressure is 120 over 86, pulse is now 88, respiration is 24, I'm calling the physician. I'm seeing everything going up so I know I'm getting rid of hypotension. So really one is that gross tremors, delirium, hyperactivity. So again, monitor the vital signs. Any shift moving upwards tells me alcohol withdrawal. So would it be like, are you looking for like a slow shift or like a gradual um, any shift? Any shift going up. If in a half an hour, an hour, I start to see a shift up, I'm concerned. Even if they started at, like I said, 110 over 70, and now they're 120 over 86, that's a jump. Even though it's still within normal, I'm concerned. Everything's going up. So if there was a question that said it acts as like the nurse, to, would the nurse reassess vital signs, or would the nurse call the physician? Basically, you're just going to right away call the, the call the physician. And the reason I'm stressing this is because that was a question. Okay. Um, sometimes I I know the things that oh, students have trouble with. I are they using the same test questions? I don't know, but it was a question, so I want to know any shift upwards is a concern. All right, uh, recovered alcoholic relapses and drinks a glass of wine. The client presents in the emergency department, experiences severe thro throbbing mm -hmm. headache tachycardia, flushed face, dyspnea, and continuous vomiting. What may this symptom indicate to the emergency room nurse? A reaction to the disulfiram, the antabuse. Um, so again, um, why do we give this medication? To stop them from drinking. Okay. Typically, oh, we have yes. their consent. Okay. We don't just give it to them. They know <coughs> they're taking it. They've agreed to take it. It's usually somebody who knows that, oh my God, my life is falling apart. My wife, my husband, my spouse, my partner wants to leave me. And I want to do right. I want this medication. But sometimes they cannot. Um, hold to it and they will go and drink but they'll end up severe vomiting, uh, throbbing headache and all these symptoms that you would have. Um, but again it's they'll, they'll take it. We, you know, we don't hide it and give it to them. They, they have to agree to take it. 
Um, and it, all products that contain antibute, they need to um, make sure that they don't take anything that has alcohol. Um, I mean, all products that contain alcohol, they do not want to take while they're on anti antibute. All right, this is also drug overdose. Someone takes heroin. What medication are we given? Narcan. So again, given Narcan and opiate antagonists, um, we want our big goals is to uh, assess and support respiratory and cardiovascular function, um, and again, to provide safety. So somebody comes in and they're in an uh, overdose from some type of opioid, what position are we putting them in? High fowlers, so we want them high fowlers. We want to probably give them IV. We want to assess uh, if we, you know, we want to make sure they have a good airway. Give uh, Narcan, and we may need to assess to see if we need to give them any more. So the latter is only if you're going to worry about they're going to like aspirate or something like that. Or Correct. So if they're completely unresponsive, um, I may put them um, lateral if they're going to vomit, and I need to. Um, you know, while I'm giving the Narcan. But again, if there's some, you know, uh, slurred speech, lethargy, I may put them high followers. Okay. Those are the big things with um, alcohol. So, respiration. So I did put blood gases here. So however you know blood gases, I want you to use. But I'm gonna just show you a quick system. Kim and Ginny said they are only having you identify what type it is. And you don't have to say if it's compensated, partially compensated, or fully compensated. So that is saving you quite a bit. So looking at this, the nurse reviews the arterial blood gas values of a client admitted with pneumonia. pH 7.51, the CO2 28, oxygen 70, and the bicarb 24. What values does this indicate? So before, oops, I need my marker. Um, if we answer that, you can see I do it as a three step. You can do tic-tac-toe three steps, you can use the arrows. I use anything less than 7.40 is acidic, what, acidic, and alkalosis. So anything greater, alkalosis. Now I know pH is 7.35 to 7.45. Why do I use 7.40? Because you can, have, and you're going to come across many blood gases that are within this range, but they're not normal. And the reason they're not normal is because they're fully compensated. And to be fully compensated, the body shifts the one that's not causing the issue in the other direction to put it back. And that's why using 7.40 helps. So let me go back to this one. So what I do, and actually I usually do three steps, but we're not going to do the third because that would just tell me if it's compensated or not, but I'm not doing that one. So first I want to do label the pH. Anything greater than 7.40 is alkalosis. Somebody caused, and when I say somebody, it's either my metabolic or respiratory guy or girl caused the issue. So if metabolic caused it, they have to be greater than 26. And in this situation, they are 24. So, and again, you can use that uh, tic-tac-toe if you want. My respiratory guy has to be less than 35. And my PCO2 is 28. So who caused respiratory alkalosis? My respiratory guy. That's it. That's as far as they want you to go. Um, and, and in this situation, 
This is my Oops. I think I picked up the wrong papers here. Okay. So, and in this situation, it's respiratory alkalosis. A is the correct answer. So, but I'm going to have, I'm going to do more. So again, step one, label the pH. I'm going to label it by 7.40. Step two, who caused it? And we're going to end there for that before. Uh, when we do NCLEX prep uh, later in the semester, I'll teach you step three, determine if there's compensation. You're going to do it? Yes. Um, all right, so this is just what I wrote on the board. <laughs> okay, so this one. The nurse reviews the blood gas results of a client with Guillain-Barre syndrome. The nurse analyzes the results and determines that the patient is experiencing respiratory acidosis. Which of the following validate the nurse's finding? To be acidosis, I have to have a pH less than 7.40. So I immediately get rid of A, and I immediately get rid of D. So now, um, for respiratory acid, for respiratory to cause it, it has, for respiratory to cause acidosis, it has to be above 45. See. So I come over here and see which one is above um, 45 and it's six. All right, to review the arterial blood gas, the client notes the following, pH 7.45, PCA 0230, and bicarb 22. The nurse analyzes these results as indicated. So I look at this and I say, 7.45, using my 7.40, label the pH alkalosis. Who caused alkalosis? I'm not leaving this side. Once I know it's alkalosis, I'm not leaving this side. My metabolic, which is 22, has to be greater than 26. It's not. My respiratory guy has to be less than 35. And it is. So who caused it? Respiratory alkalosis. And C. And C. I was just seeing if there was another alkalosis to compensation. But again, I'm not getting into compensation right now because it'll confuse you. So C is the answer. <coughs> The nurse can for a client when the nasogastric tube is attached to low suction. The nurse wants his client know that the client is at risk for which acid-based disorder. So I know the tube's going into my stomach. Instantly, I know metabolic, so I can get rid of respiratory. So is it acidosis or alkalosis? Alkalosis. Why is it alkalosis? It's sucking out everything, so that's acid. What's happening yeah, with alkaline. the suction is it's, take, it's sucking out the hydrochloric acid, all the acids from my stomach, and neutralizing the stomach contents, causing an alkalosis state. If it's diarrhea, what's it going to be? Acidosis. Metabolic acidosis. Acidosis. <laughs> so, did you guys have blood gases in 1020? Yes. yes. Catherine. Anyone did not? Okay. Because here's the thing I just posted on my learning. I got my learning. I'm sure. Um, e learning. I don't know what I'm saying. E learning. Right underneath library, I just put Karen's test review, and I just put the oxygenation slides. Cool. So Thank I'm going to leave these for you. Anyone that has trouble, I want you calling me tomorrow, and I'll do them one-on-one -on -one with you. But uh, what's down, and don't, I don't care about compensation. Just go and put them all. Um, and you know, I got someone, 
when I get something like the 7.40 right smack in the middle, oh my God, I can't shift to either direction. All I can do is check is my C2, uh, my uh, respiratory is in the normal range, my bicarb's in the normal range, and that's normal. But you will have situations where I would much rather back into a norm than miss a blood gas level. That's why I use 7.40, because many of them are within 7.35, 7.45, but they're not normal. That, so use the 7.40 and it will help you. The answers are there and there's another slide at the end with blood gases. But I will work one on one. If you don't have it, to me this is like math. You gotta get it down. And especially since they're getting rid of compensation for the test, you got it easy. And I wanna make sure you have it. So call me, I will work one on one with you. I hope there's 10 questions. Okay. A client with severe burns to the head and neck is being admitted to the ICU. The client is demonstrating strider and will need to be mechanically ventilated. The nurse should prepare to assist with the implementation of. So most people are going to pick A, but let's think this through. What's strider? Something blocking the airway. The airway is closing. Why is the airway closing? Because I have severe burns. So everything's swelling. My burns are the head and neck. I need to go straight into the trachea. There is no getting an endotracheal tube. And I put this here for, uh, for a good reason, because nine out of 10 times, endotracheal tube is the correct answer. But in this situation, the only thing we can do is a trach. We have to go straight in. For a male client who has a chest tube, you don't have chest tubes on the test. Mm -hmm. I'm getting rid of these. Again, and click to review, I'll go over them. But they're not in your test, so I'm getting rid of them. Okay. An emergency room nurse is assessing a patient who sustained a blunt injury to the chest wall. Which of these signs would indicate the presence of a pneumothorax in a client? So what is a pneumothorax? Air. Collapsed Air. lung. Yeah. So how do I know I have a collapsed lung? Diminished. Diminished or no breath sounds on one side, of the side of the pneumothorax. Um, what else? I could have a tra my trachea uh, deviation. Um, that could be another sound. I mean, another sign, but um, B is the answer. So if I have a pneumothorax, I am gasping for breath. My respiration rates are going up. Uh, presence of a barrel chest, that's COPD. And a sucking sound at the site of injury. It just said blunt. It didn't say a puncture. So that's out. They specifically said a blunt, so there's no... Uh, puncture going in there. But yes, a puncture could cause a pneumothorax, but it didn't say that, so I got rid of that. So B is correct. The nurse assesses a client's respiratory status. Which observation indicate the client is experiencing difficulty breathing? How do I know they're having trouble breathing? Use of accessory muscles. So that's how use of accessory muscles uh, purse lip, control breathing, diaphragmatic breathing may help someone who's having trouble. They may be techniques to help, but use of the strider, use of accessory muscle dyspnea are all telling me difficulty breathing. For male client with endotracheal tube, which nurse in action is most essential? So we put an endotracheal tube down, what's the first thing we wanna do? We want to auscultate. We want to make sure that we're getting good air on both sides, because otherwise we could have put it down one side and we've got to pull it back just to make sure it's on both sides. A female adult has a trach but doesn't require continuous mechanical vent. 
When weaning the client from the trach tube, the nurse should initially plug the opening in the tube. So the thing is, is you sit there and say, I have no idea how to, uh, long they're gonna mechanically ventilate. So typically, I say, you know, try and go for middle of the road if you have no clue. The answer is B. But uh, 15 seconds, do I know if we can uh, plug someone? I can even hold my breath for 15 seconds. Um, so really, if we're looking, if I, someone can't last 15 seconds, I should not be plugging them. So really, we're looking at five to 10 and then trying to go upward. But I would never initially go all the way to an hour. Nurse Maureen has assisted a physician with the, oh, that's chest tube, get rid of it. On auscultation with findings suggest a right pneumothorax. Well, we've already said absence or diminished uh, breath sounds. So B is correct. Um, trying to see if I have high vent and all that. We should be coming up to those soon. Um, Nurse Oliver is caring for a client immediately after removal of an endotracheal tube. The nurse reports which of the following signs immediately if experienced. Strider. Any strider is never, never good. Pink tinge of the tube that just came out, I would expect. A few back basal and lung crackles on the right, I would expect that's probably why they had the endotracheal tube. Respiration rate 24, again, not bad but uh, Strider is never good. So a male client, a male adult patient on a mechanical vent is receiving pancuronium a bromide, uh, IV as needed. Which assessment finding indicates the patient needs another dose. Why, do, D is correct, why do we give it? It's a neuromuscular paralyzing agent to help them uh, relax and not fight the vent. So, um, so the, we would never give a neuromuscular blocking paralyzing agent to anyone that wasn't on a vent. You gave it to me right now, I'm dead. Somebody has to amboo me or put me on a vent because I can't breathe. Mm. But on a vent, that's what's doing the breathing. So, hi pressure alarm of a vent. All the things that could cause high pressure alarm. Mm -hmm. It's an obstruction, so I'm really concerned about an obstruction. So a kink, um, a mucus plug, they're biting, they're coughing, they're breathing forcefully against it. I may have to give them more medication. Those are all high pressure. Low pressure. So now I'm looking, go rushing in to see if there's a disconnection or a leak. That's what I'm looking for, for low pressure. A nurse care for a male client with acute respiratory distress syndrome. Which of the following would the nurse expect to note in the client? Somebody who's having respiratory distress. So um, again, right here, I'm keyed in low arterial partial oxygen or elevated because it's the opposite and again someone who's having acute it's going to be low what is the norm 80 to 100 80 to 100 what's the normal o2 sap 95 95 to 100 very good A male client abruptly sits up in bed, reports having difficulty breathing, and has an arterial oxygen sat of 88%. What mode of oxygen delivery would best likely reverse the manifestation? <coughs> Non-rebreather. Non Which one delivers the most precise? <coughs> the Venturi mask. Yep, very good. On arrival to the intensive care unit, critically ill female client suffers respiratory arrest and is placed on a mechanical vent. The physician orders pulse oximetry to monitor the client's arterial oxygen sat non-invasively. Which vital sign abnormally may alter pulse oximetry? So everyone looks at this and they, a lot of times they pick the wrong one. So let me rephrase this. Non-invasive, 
pulse oximetry. Tell me all the things that can affect that pulse ox. Circulation. Circulation. Breathing. Um, circulation, the dark nail polish, and cold fingers. How many times have I had to have people put their hands in their pocket and then I'll do it again? So which one here would be circulation, cold, or dark fingernail? Hypotension. A lot of people go for one of these. But your heart rate and breathing do not affect the pulse oximeter. It is um, your hypertension. So let's see. So fever, tachypnea, and tachycardia don't affect pulse oximetry values directly. Nurse E formulates a nursing diag formulates a nursing diagnosis of activity intolerance related to inadequate oxygenation and dyspnea for client with chronic bronchitis. To minimize the problem, the nurse instructs the client to avoid conditions that increase oxygen demand. Without looking, what increases oxygen demand? Somebody obesity. Um, smoking, exposure to extreme temperatures, so extreme heat, extreme cold, or stress. And in this situation, it's B. At 11 p.m., a male client is admitted to the emergency department. He has a respiration rate of, four, rate of 44. He's anxious and wheezes are audible. The client is immediately given oxygen by math and methylprednisone. IV. At 11.30, the, nurse, the client's arterial blood gas sat is 86 and is still wheezing. The nurse should plan to administer. So wheezing, low O2 sat, what do we need? A bronchodilator. So which one here says bronchodilator? D. Yeah. <laughs> so morphine is going to slow the respiration. Right, that's decrease the <laughs> Um, a female client is receiving supplemental oxygen. When determining the effectiveness of oxygen therapy, which arterial blood gas value is most important? So basically, which one tells me if oxygen is good? The, uh, partial, uh, the partial pressure of arterial oxygen that you are seeing. That's the one that's going to tell me if the oxygen is good or not. Okay, I think we just did this one. A patient suffers an adult respiratory distress syndrome as a consequence of sh shock. The patient condition deteriorates rapidly and an endotracheal intubation and mechanical vent are initiated. When the high pressure alarm on the mechanical vent sounds, the nurse should check the cause, and the cause is? A. A. And we did this one, the most precise delivery so which is the following types of oxygen delivery would the nurse anticipate to be prescribed for again um, for the uh, precise there it is delivery of precise so B then surely a nurse is teaching the client how to use a metered dose inhaler to administer corticosteroid drugs which of the following client actions indicate he is used in the MDI correctly select all that apply. The inhaler is upright in for MDI true. true. Head is tilted down while inhaling False. the medication. False. False. It's usually up or back. Client waits five minutes between puffs. False. 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 We usually just wait seconds. Mouth is rinsed with water following administration. True. 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 Client lies supine for 15 minutes following False. administration. False. False. So the only two are A and D. Okay, so let me just pause here to make sure. So prevention of ventilator-assisted pneumonia. Tell me the things you want to do. Mouth care. Oral mouth care every two hours. Head of the bed, elevated 30, elevated 30 degrees. Prophylactis. DVT. Uh, peptic ulcer. DVT. Peptic ulcer, peptic. prophylactis. DVT. 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 Prophylactis. Um, uh, sedation, daily sedation vacation. 
So that means we want to hold off of giving them the neuromuscular paralyzing agents. They can take good deep breaths on their own and early mobilization. Um, so what about prone? Yeah, so if the other things aren't working, we may need to put them prone to really try and expand the lungs. Isn't it for like 18 to 20 hours a day? Correct, and we're going to medicate them because it's yeah. not going to, if they don't have the neuromuscular paralyzing agent, they're not going to be happy laying prone when they can barely breathe as it is. Um, okay, so um, when, how often do we suction someone? Every two hours. As needed. What tells me somebody needs it? Gurgles, but more not so much gurgles as um, adventitious lung sounds, rails. So how do I know suctioning was effective? They stop. They stop, yeah. they stop clear lung sounds. <laughs> so decrease. Very good. Um, what is one of my, for nursing, one of my most important things before I suction? Pre-oxygenate. Pre Very good. Um, all right. All right, I think that's it, because everything else is um, Does that just... Does that have a little Say it again? Okay, so um, here I have some things that cause respiratory alkalosis, um, metabolic respiratory acidosis, and I also have I've got a bunch of gases, if anyone wants to... <laughs> so again, it's just one of those that you want to make sure you get that right. So um, talk to me about acute respiratory distress syndrome. So what is the management? Somebody's having acute respiratory distress syndrome. What is it? Oxygen. Yeah, so that's it. So in, usually we need to give high concentration of oxygen by uh, intubation, ventilation, sedate them, and everything else we just talked about for vent related. So we want positioning, turn every two hours, so all of um, that. Um, sedate. <laughs> All right. So, renal. Let's go through some renal. All right. So, the kind of serum potassium is 6.6. .6. The nurse should anticipate an order for. What are we going to get an order for? K exhalate. So, um, what are symptoms of hyperkalemia? I think I asked this already. Hyperkalemia, so, the peak T waves. Peak T waves, <laughs> cardiac <laughs> irregularity, muscle cramps, diarrhea, uh, nausea. Foods that I want to avoid. For potassium. You can have apples. You can have apples. You can have apples. I want foods. Tell me what I can't eat. No bananas. No bananas. No uh, potatoes, no uh, oranges, no yogurt, um, no avocado, no spinach, spinach um, no salt substitute or fish. You can have that apple. But you can have that apple. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. The nurse care for a client with chronic yeah. renal failure, the lab results indicate hypocalcemia and hyperphosphatemia. So um, when assessing the client, the nurse should be alert for which of the following, select all that apply. So, all right, so. So hypo, so first of all, before I go, um, just going back to 1020, when calcium's down, phosphorus up. When calcium's up, phosphorus is down. And again, having that imbalance will lead to brittle bones and pathological fractures. 
So, because yes, the last one's correct. But again, now I want to see which one of these would indicate hypocalcemia or hyperphosphatemia. But again, a lot of these are going to be more hypocalcemia. So, true so sign. True. What's the other, other one we do? Chabostics. Cardiac um, arrhythmias. Yes. True. True. Constipation. You're not quite sure, but no, it's diarrhea. So that's false. Decreased clotting time. Again, not sure, but it's increased clotting time. And then drowsiness and lethargy, we're going to have anxiety and irritability. So let me, uh, signs and symptoms for, um, for hypocalcemia is cardiac arrhythmias, positive trousseau sign, positive Chabox sign, diarrhea, increased clotting, um, neuromuscular hyperexcitability, anxiety, irritability, um, and then again, possibly all this could lead to seizures. So I can label them, but A, B, and E. A, B, C, D, E, O, oh, F, that's F. A, B, A, B, F? A, B, F. Um, so what type of medication do we want to avoid with renal? NSAIDs. 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 NSAIDs, absolutely. So no NSAIDs. What about um, medication with magnesium? So it's very rare, but going back to 1020, it's very rare that anyone has hypermagnesium, except for your, if you're in renal failure and taking medication with magnesium. So magnesium, your mylanta, milk of magnesia, um, anything that has magnesium, metamucil, there's most of our M meds we're avoiding because it's going to cause them to have hypermagnesium. Okay, a nurse reviewed the arterial blood gas report for client who's chronic renal failure. Which of the following is an expected finding? So without, you no, know, someone in chronic renal failure, again, I'm thinking, okay, it's got to be metabolic. Which condition is most common for renal failure? Metabolic acidosis. Just remember, so now come in here. I know it's uh, acidosis, so my pH has to be less than 7.40, so I instantly get rid of C and D, and because I know it's going to be metabolic, it has to be, my bicon has to be less than 22, which A is the correct answer. The nurse is applying with acute kidney injury to modify the diet in which of the way? Select all that apply. So what is my diet for renal failure? Renal failure diet. Low sodium. Low sodium. So fluid restriction, low sodium. Restricted protein. Low potassium. And again, we, we're concerned about, um, uh, yeah, we, we want to be liberal with the carbs, but um, not too concerned. Um, you know, again, we, we are going to watch the carbs, but less of a concern. So, true or false, renal diet, restricted protein, true, liberal sodium, false, it's restricted or low, it's restricted. Fluid restriction, true or false? True. false. true. Low potassium? True. Low fat? False. false. We can have fat. I know. All right, so the other thing that we may want to add to the diet is they, um, they have a problem with erythropoietin. Um, again, it produces the red blood cell. What is a supplement I'm going to add? 
So, um, again, problem stimulating bone marrow to produce red blood cells? Iron. Iron. Anemia. No, it's not. No, so we're going to give them iron. Okay. Your patient's complaining of muscle cramps while undergoing hemodialysis. Which intervention is effective in relieving muscle cramps? So why would they, they go through hemodialysis while undergoing it, they have muscle cramps. Why would they have muscle cramps? So electrolytes are off. I pulled off too much fluid, low sodium, because I probably pulled off too much sodium and I need to replace my electrolytes. So again, muscle cramps, usually low sodium. So I need a hypertonic normal saline solution going back. Hemodialysis, how do we um, connect? AV fistula. So tell me some precautions for AV fistula. No VP on that arm. So at least every four hours, we need to listen and feel. Is it like vibrating the brewing? So we're gonna um, feel for a thrill, listen for the brewing. You don't want the whistling. Yeah. You don't want the whistling when you listen. So say that again, what don't you want? You don't want a whistle sound. It tells you, you want a clock. swish tone. Yeah, you do want a nice swish. Has anyone listened? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. It's a strong yes. sound. So whenever you have it, every four hours. So you're right. So maybe it's a low, soft sound, uh, like it's yeah. strangling. But it should almost be like uh, anyone who's gone white water rafting. I, I just know because I've fallen underneath in a, uh, like a rapid uh, since four, and underneath, that's all I can think of is all this turbulence and everything else going through. Um, all right, so blood work for renal failure. BUN and creatinine. So BUN, what's the norm? 7 to 20. Creatinine, what's the norm? 0 0.6 to 1.1 or 1.2, right in there. The client is undergoing peritoneal dialysis. The dialysis dwell time is completed, then dwell clamp is open, allow the dialysate to drain. The nurse notes the drainage has stopped and only 500 ml has drained. The amount of the dialysis instilled was 1,500. Which of the following interventions would be done first? So we want to check for kinks. That's what's going to be done first. What's going to be done next is change their position. So again, we don't expect to put 1,500 in and only 500 back. That's a huge difference. You know, we may expect maybe a, a plus 100, minus. 100, again, depends if they need fluid or we need to take it off, but I'd never expect a 1,000 to remain in them. Which of the following factors cause nausea associated with renal failure? Bless you. So, I, I, I don't know if you have DOD, but it's accumulation of waste products. So um, someone who has impaired, impaired renal functioning and we're concerned about output, what's the normal output? 30, 30 mLs an hour. So if they have less, we're concerned. And again, call a physician. Um, three phase, did you have three phases or four? I don't know how many phases, but what's the uric phase? It's four. It's onset, four. Onset. Onset. So all uric is that they have urine, um, less urine output, so they're going to retain. So again, less than 424 hours. non uric phase is normal output, glomerular filtration rate is low. And then the enuric phase is no uh, urine output. Once we hit that no urine, that's when all the electrolytes are really a concern. 
um, I tend to be less concerned with my uh, electrolyte imbalance if they are able to urinate, but once they stop, it's a problem. Which of the following time is a great source for developing acute renal failure? D, absolutely. For acute renal failure, diabetic who needs to undergo a, cardi a heart catheterization with contrast dye. One of the first things we do, someone who's suspected of diabetes and needs a uh, cardiac cath is we're going to check the BUN and creatinine because we could put them into renal failure with that dye. So, um, the client with chronic renal failure is at risk for developing dementia related to excessive absorption of aluminum. So I already talked about magnesium, now we're on aluminum. Uh, the nurse teaches that this reason that the client's being prescribed, which is the following phosphate binding agent. So again, we want to sometimes give a med to pull off the phosphorus, but we try to want to avoid aluminum because of there's a she lot of studies how right? B is the and only acid, one that's correct the answer. Calcium, but uh, there's a correlation to mm -hmm. increase aluminum with dementia and Alzheimer. So we try to cut back on the aluminum uh, that they have. All right, just checking my notes before I move on. Um, Okay, the client with chronic renal failure returns to the nurse unit following a hemodialysis treatment. On assessment, the nurse notes the client's temperature is 100.2, which of the following is the most appropriate nursing action. So again, she's coming, the person's coming back from hemodialysis. I look at this and say 100.2, not too bad, and you've got to remember just going through the machine warms the blood. So really, my answer is I want to continue to monitor. It's normal right after to have a low uh, grade temperature. If it continues to go up, then I'm concerned that there's um, an infection going on. But normally, it's OK. When do we give blood pressure meds for dialysis? After uh, hemodialysis. The nurse performing an assessment on a client who has returned from the dialysis unit following hemodialysis. The client is complaining of a headache and nausea and is extremely restless. Which of the following is the most appropriate nursing action? So first of all, what's going on? Anyone know the condition? Disequilibrium syndrome. Disequilibrium syndrome is characterized by headache, mental confusion, decreasing level of conscious, Nausea, vomiting, twitching, and possible seizure. Why do they have it? Rapid removal of the solutes and fluid from the body. So, um, of these, now knowing what's your priority. No, not, notify the physician. They can have a seizure. So, I'm notifying the physician. You can't call them all the time, but basically, it's not telling me disequilibrium syndrome. So this question wants wants you to recognize that it's dis, uh, disequilibrium syndrome, and they want you to know that it's serious. So I by the question, like sometimes because on this one it says like call the physician, don't call the physician. Like I wish you could just call the physician every time. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, no, nope, that won't work. <laughs> Um, so why peritoneal dialysis versus hemodialysis? More freedom. Peritoneal, more freedom. Um, there are contraindications for peritoneal. So if they've had abdominal surgery, they've had frequent peritonitis. So again, uh, rid, board rigid um, abdomen or they have cloudy dialysate. They, um, if they've had frequent, um, they may switch them over to hemodialysis. If someone's unable to maintain a schedule of independence, they may just go to hemodialysis. So, but again, certainly um, it would be more freedom for peritoneal dialysis. The nurse preparing to care for a client with 
uh, receiving peritoneal dialysis, which of the following would be included in the nursing plan of care to prevent major complications associated with peritoneal dialysis? So which one? Peritonitis is our biggest concern and strict asepsis is what we're going to do. Um, very good. The client being hemodialyzed suddenly becomes short of breath and complains of chest pain. The client is tachycardic, pale, and anxious. The nurse suspects ear embolism. What should you do? You're going to immediately stop the dialysis and notify the physician. Yeah, you saw it. I was in that class. I'm so excited to hear you say that. I have never seen an ear embolism in all my years. Um, so you are like the first person I know that has seen that. So I was in class excited for you. You know, I felt bad for the patient. I know. She's very nice. Um, the nurse assesses the client who has chronic renal failure and notes the following. <laughs> crackles in the lung base, elevated blood pressure, and weight gain of two pounds in one day. Based on these data, which of the following nurse and diagnosis is appropriate? So nurse and diagnosis, um, A, 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 yep. Um, excessive fluid volume related to kidneys inability to maintain fluid balance. In care for a male client with acute renal failure, nurse Catherine expects to adjust the dosage of dosing schedule of certain drugs. Which of the following drugs would not require such adjustment? I already said that this is metabolized by the liver, so it doesn't need to be adjusted. All these others are metabolized by the kidney and would need to be adjusted. All right, so these are just FYI things, but I do know I didn't talk about, is heart failure? No. 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 OK, perfect. So, um, <laughs> so these are just uh, FYI. I will do questions. So I'm going to look through the slides. Like I sat through class tonight, I'll do some on stress. Um, and Communication, I don't usually do the leadership because people find that so straightforward, common sense, so I don't even waste my time. But I will send questions tonight, tomorrow, and Wednesday. On e-learning or email? By email, yes. So normal thorax is not, but the problem is, is acute respiratory distress ventilator could have a pneumothorax. It's the whole reason you're positioning them to prevent a pneumothorax. So that's why suctioning could play a role, and that could be on it. So, um, so your test is on Thursday from pretty much after breakfast on Thursday, no more studying. Um, I, at that point, I want a good night's sleep on Wednesday into Thursday. So the day group cannot study Thursday, I mean Wednesday evening, you guys can, but I want you in bed before 10. So, then you have clinical, you gotta go home and go to bed. You can't study. You need to study as a group in clinical because it, the best yeah, right. test that people have is when they have a good night's sleep. Can you let her check the note? Can you sit on that email? Can you okay <laughs> that? <laughs> tell her to do a post. Tell her I had suggested. Who is your clinical instructor? We have one. We have Phil. We have Phil. Oh, so you get out at 7. That's still 12 hours. Yeah, not we get out, we get out, out, get out, out at 10. So you get out at 10. I was going to say, um, tell them I had mentioned doing an online post-clinical just to help. How about we just oh do my, a Wait, wait. What does that mean? So that would mean what's, maybe what's a day or two after the test, they can just, you can post uh, how clinical, so do a, like an online discussion. Eight, okay. not synchronous. I don't like that. You all have to get on at the same time. But asynchronous where you could just all talk about what you did. I feel like we should do like a B-symmetry. All right, have a good night. I don't see rain, so 